Now today, as we continue our studies in the London Confession of Faith, I should say for those of you who do not have a copy of the 1689 London Confession, that much of the material that we will be considering together this morning will be found at the back of the hymn book in the section on the Westminster Confession, and in particular that which is entitled uh, Chapter 26 on the Communion of the Saints. Now as we begin together, let us pray and ask for God's blessing upon our studies. Our Father, as we come once again into your presence this morning, we come with that hope and longing that you will once again be gracious unto us, that you will manifest your presence, your power here. We thank you that we have known your nearness in the past. Thank you that we have known your help and assistance in enlarging our hearts and encouraging us with a sight of your truth. We pray that as we come again this morning, that you will not leave us empty and that you will not leave us to ourselves, but that, O oh God, you will come, that you will encourage our hearts with a sight of the truth, that you will bless us with your own presence, and that by your Holy Spirit you will write your word upon our hearts. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, as you can see, I've written on the board an overview of the chapters of the Confession which deal with subject matter which would normally be handled in systematic theology under the broad topic of the doctrine of the church. Now, I believe as best I'm able to organize it that in chapter 26 of our Confession, the writers are giving us an overview of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and have structured it, as I suggested, in accordance with the two various sources from which they drew their materials. They drew material, first of all, from the Westminster Confession and Savoy Declaration in paragraphs 1 through 4, in which they dealt with the subject of the universal church. Then they went to the Savoy Doctrine of Church Polity, the Savoy Statement of Polity, from which they drew paragraphs 5 to 15, dealing with the subject of the local church and the practical ramifications of its life. Then in chapter 27, which the Lord willing we will also consider this morning, they, uh, they deal with the matter of the fellowship of the church. They're still dealing with the basic subject of the life and communion of the people of God here upon earth, but now they've changed their focus and they're focusing upon that, uh, that personal spiritual communion which the people of God have with one another in their various interactions. And then in paragraph, I'm sorry, in chapters 28 through 30, they deal with the subject of the sacraments of the church, a general statement in chapter 28 and then chapter 29, Baptism, and chapter 30, the Lord's Supper. So all of those things have reference to the broad uh, sphere of ecclesiology. They give us an overview of the church, and the fellowship of the church, and then the sacraments of the church. Now, hopefully I had hoped to finish all of this last week and failed, came to... Uh, just about up to paragraph number 15. So we'll have a brief word of review concerning some of the matters we saw here respecting the local church, and we'll get into the completion of that this morning, hopefully chapter 27, and still have time left for questions. Now, we saw that in their treatment of the subject of the local church that they had basically divided it as far as I'm able to tell, in their rearrangement, because they did rearrange the Savoy material into three sections. In paragraphs 5 to 7, they dealt with the major features of local churches, and they said that their formation is mandatory in paragraph 5, that their membership is evangelical and voluntary in paragraph 6, 
and that their functioning is autonomous or independent in paragraph 7. And so those three major features of local churches are set out before us there. Then secondly, they deal with the government of local churches in paragraphs 8 through 13. They first of all give us the substance of of local church government and defining the church officers in paragraphs 8 and 9. And in paragraphs 10 and 11, they open up the cornerstone or foundation of local church government, which is the ministry of the Word of God. And then in in paragraphs 10 and 11, and then in paragraphs 12 and 13, they deal with the extent of local church government, that it extends to all members, and that it is intended by God to extend to all offenses and problems which arise in the life of the church. So after they've laid out the major features of church life and the lo- and local church government, then they come in paragraphs 14 and 15 to deal with what you could call interchurch or intrachurch relations. And uh, I received some comments about that last time, and maybe I'll just say a word about it. Um, if, if you look at the church as a whole, or if you look at the church as individual churches, you see, remember, we said that the churches collectively equal the church. Well, if you're speaking collectively, it's intra church. If you're speaking individually, it's inter church. And it doesn't really matter. I think. So it's both. It's both inter- and intra-church relations, depending on whether you're using the word collectively or individually. So I'll leave it up to you to use any way you like. Now, we saw that, first of all, in paragraph 14, they deal with the subject of inter-church fellowship and that inter-church fellowship is divided into the responsibilities that each individual church has and then the responsibility that the churches have, so it's considered singular and then plural. With regard to the responsibility of each church, they say that the responsibility is to pray for the other churches, for the good of the people of God. And with respect to the responsibility of the churches, when they're planted by providence near to one another, their responsibility is to hold communion among themselves. And we said that this would consist of such things as pulpit exchanges and joint meetings for worship and camps and suppers and conferences and other ways in which this communion among the churches can be practically expressed. Now then, having looked at interchurch fellowship, We come now to paragraph 15, which deals with inter-church differences. Inter-church differences. And I'll read the paragraph and then we'll consider it together. In cases of difficulties or differences, either in point of doctrine or administration, wherein either the churches in general are concerned or any one church in their peace, union, and edification, or any member or members of any church are injured in or by any proceedings in censures not agreeable to truth and order, it is according to the mind of Christ that many churches holding communion together do by their messengers meet to consider and give their advice in or about that matter in difference to be reported to all the churches concerned. How be it? These messengers assembled are not entrusted with any church power properly so-called or with any jurisdiction over the churches themselves to exercise any censures either over any churches or persons or to impose their determination on the churches and officers. 
Now, as you can perhaps tell from the way that I read that paragraph, the paragraph is divided into three parts. First of all, up to the colon, they deal with the matter of the occasions in vision. The occasions in vision. And then secondly, they lay before us the method conceived by Christ for dealing with these differences, the occasions of differences, the method conceived of for dealing with the differences, but then thirdly, the limitations imposed by Christ in dealing with the differences. So you have the occasions envisioned, the method conceived, and the limitations faced or imposed. All right, first of all, the occasions in vision. The occasions are difficulties, differences. And these differences can be either in point of doctrine, doctrinal differences, in administration, particularly matters relating to the administration of church discipline. These differences can be related to a number of churches or to one particular church. And these differences are serious matters, matters which, if not resolved, will affect the peace, the union, and the edification of the church. Also, these differences can relate to the particular problems of individuals, individuals who have been wronged by people like Diotrephes, mentioned in 3rd John, who would who cast out of the church those who would receive the brethren, and he himself does not receive the brethren. Here's a man acting in the exercise of church power in a way which is not agreeable to truth, not agreeable to order, not agreeable to righteousness, and in so acting, he's injuring his Christian brethren, putting them out of the church, wrongly excommunicating them, or here, wrongly censuring them. So the Bible is not so unrealistic or idealistic about the life of the church that it presents to us such a flowery picture that it's inconceivable that a church would ever act unagreeable to truth and to order and to righteousness in censuring and excommunicating people. If such a thing happens, then it must be dealt with. It is possible that a Diotrephes could raise his ugly head in the church, or that doctrinal differences could threaten the unity of a church, or that other matters of administration, which are not according to the word of God, could threaten the edification of God's people and the peace of the people of God. Now, those are the occasions envisioned. You see that? Now, what's the proper way of dealing with those occasions? If something like that happens, notice that the confession states that it's according to the mind of Christ that many churches holding communion together do by their messengers meet to consider and give their advice in or about that matter to, reported to, to be reported to all the churches concerned. In other words, here you have the concept of interchurch counsel and advice. There's a problem in a given local church or there's a problem in a given geographic area, and that problem is too big for the elders, for the government of one particular local church to sort out. If that's so, and if the problem is too big to be sorted out locally, then there is this provision made whereby various churches holding communion together can agree to send messengers and these messengers meet together to form a council to consider the matter, to give their advice, to give their judgment in the interest of the pursuit of peace. Now, of course, they do not say here 
that any individual member of the church who feels or believes that he has been wronged can unilaterally call a council of the churches to sort out his problem. It doesn't say that. Because next, the next thing that is said is that there are limitations upon this and that even when the council has been duly called and convened, the council doesn't have the right to impose its decision upon the officers of any local church. How much less, therefore, does an individual have the right to impose his own judgment upon an entire church and force a church into such a situation where a council like this is called? No. If a person has been injured or grieved by censures not agreeable to truth or to order, the thing to do is to attempt to sort that matter out locally. But this, the calling of such a council cannot be done, and no church can be forced to participate in such a thing, nor any group of church officers forced to participate in such a thing, contrary to their judgment and conscience. Furthermore, if someone does have a problem with matters of administration and order, it certainly indicates here that there is no biblical ground to think that what they have the right to do is thereby to take the matter into their own hands personally and individually and determine that they are going to write letters to all the members of the church and sort out this matter themselves as though they were the rightful authority and government in the church to sort out the problem. Do you see the arrogance, the high-handedness, the presumption of anyone daring to do such a thing as that? To sit himself in the place not only of having the right to run the church himself as though he were recognized, or she, as the appropriate government of the church, but even to bypass such a method as this, which God has ordained in his grace and mercy, that we are not totally alone. And sometimes we can become, I think, so involved in our own personal things as to get things out of perspective. And thereby we have brethren surrounding us. And when we get in water too deep, it's appropriate that we should have the counsel of our brethren in sorting out difficult problems. But for an individual to take himself and to usurp the place of the government of an individual church, or even to bypass this God-given method when things do get out of hand in a local assembly, is the height of of arrogance and presumption. Now, notice that even when these messengers are so gathered together that there are limitations faced by these messengers, even these churches gathered together to sort out the problem in this particular church have limitations. Notice, how be it? These messengers assembled are not entrusted with any church power properly so-called or with any jurisdiction over the churches themselves to exercise censures either over churches or persons or to impose their determination on the churches and officers. They have the right if this church agrees to it, and its officers agree to it, to have the facts of the given matter set before them, and then to come to a judgment upon that matter, having listened to it, heard from the various sides of it, <coughs> then come to a judgment, then give their counsel, but in so doing, they don't have the right to impose that judgment unilaterally upon this church those officers, or any such person. Once they've given their counsel, that is the place where the matter must rest. If they think they can take it further, then what they have done is they ceased being elders 
or messengers or representatives of local churches and they have become apostles. And even though a group of people may be wrong, two wrongs do not make a right. And even though this particular local group may be wrong in the direction it's taking and may not listen to the counsel of their brethren, that still doesn't make their brethren apostles and give them the right to then step in, depose elders, and take over in a given church situation. No group of men has the right to do that. And to say they do is to claim they have powers given only to the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the passage that would be sometimes used to justify the creation of a presbyterial type of government, empowering men with apostolic authority, is Acts chapter 15. Now, in Acts chapter 15, the concern is not a matter of administration or discipline, but the concern, as you know, is a matter of doctrine. In particular, there were certain men who had come down from Jerusalem, and these men were teaching, as is given to us in Acts 15.1, They were teaching, except you be circumcised after the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. That circumcision is absolutely necessary unto salvation. Now, it is sometimes said that upon this occasion, a synod was called and that representatives from the various churches were sent. The matter was discussed. The various representatives gave their judgment, which was then imposed upon the churches. But I submit to you that that is not what happened. That is not what the text says. The churches did not send each of them, all the ones that had been created, according to Acts chapter 14. They did not send messengers to Jerusalem, and the various elders of the churches did not sit down, discuss it, come to a mind, and impose it on them. That's not what happened. Rather, what happened is this, that Paul and Barnabas, after dissenting with these people, went up to the apostles and elders at Jerusalem about the question. Verse 4. The apostles and elders at Jerusalem exercised apostolic authority. They themselves debated the matter, and when they had come to one mind, they gave their judgment, and that judgment was regarded as a decree which was then imposed upon the churches with their various elders. Look at Acts chapter 16 and verse 4. And as they went on their way through the cities, they delivered them the decrees to keep, which had been ordained by the apostles and elders, which were at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Now, the point is this, that there was not a situation in which the churches which had been formed all sent their representatives up to Jerusalem. They all decided authoritatively and then came back and imposed it on the church. That's not what happened. What happened is the church at Antioch sent these people up to Jerusalem and the elders and apostles at Jerusalem decided on the question and then sent a decree which they imposed upon the various churches. That's what happened. And for these brethren... To say that now they have the right to do this because the apostles and elders do it is precisely to say that they now have apostolic authority, which is precisely what they do not have. It is precisely what they do not have. And that's the point. That for them then 
the brethren described in Acts 14, where it says that there was, uh, these are the people talked about, Acts 14, 21 to 23, when they preached the gospel to that city, they made many disciples. And then verse 23, when they had appointed for them elders in every church and prayed with fasting. Well, this is, these are the same group of people that then had the decree delivered to them. For them to say that now because we're elders, now we have the right to meet together, make decrees, impose them on the churches, that's to assume that now they have the authority of the apostles, an authority which they were never given, authority which they never exercised, and never claimed. And the fact that the apostles and elders at Jerusalem who exercised that apostolic authority, James, the half-brother of our Lord, and the others, we're not sure who exactly they were, the fact that those men have now died and gone on to glory does not mean, does not mean that we have now inherited their authority. We have not inherited apostolic office because the apostles are gone. Apostolic succession is not found in local church elders inheriting apostolic authority. Apostolic succession is found right here in this book. Here's the authority of the apostles. Though they are now dead and in heaven, yet they still live in the words of Scripture and they still exercise their authority through their writings over all the churches. Here are the decrees which they are now imposing on us all. That is the continuation of apostolic authority. It is not now that we elders at Trinity and Carlisle and Media and the other place can come together and decide and impose. No, 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 no. Here's apostolic authority. Here's the only decrees given for the whole church to be imposed upon all the churches until Jesus Christ returns. That's the biblical concept of apostolic succession. It is not rooted in the elders of local churches. It's not rooted in the Pope at Rome. It's rooted in the Word of God, in the things which the apostles themselves have written and which are now to be with us until the end. And so these limitations which we face in our efforts to sort out the problems of other churches when we are invited to do so, these limitations are simply the limitations consistent with a proper and biblical view of apostolic authority and apostolic succession in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now then we come, having considered chapter 26, we come to consider chapter 27. Now, the writers of the Confession of Faith have made some changes with respect to the Westminster Confession at this point. Now, I understand how the changes were made, and I'll tell you briefly how they were made, but I don't want to get you bogged down in it. You'll notice if you don't have a copy of the 1689 London Confession and you're using the back of the hymn book, that this subject is treated in the Westminster Confession in chapter 26, uh, yes, rather than 27, and that there are three paragraphs rather than two. And the first paragraph in the Westminster Confession deals with the roots of the communion of the people of God, and that roots is their unity to Jesus Christ. Uh, sorry, those roots are their unity to Jesus Christ himself. Secondly, in the second paragraph, they deal with the practical expression of that unity. And then in the third paragraph, they deal with some of the qualifications of that unity and communion. Now, John Owen and company, in writing this, the Savoy Declaration, changed the basic format of the Westminster Confession. And in the Savoy Declaration, they have only two paragraphs. And our 1689 London Confession is built in its structure upon the Savoy Declaration. It has two paragraphs, however. 
the writers of Savoy deleted certain important and good statements from the Westminster Confession, and I have no idea why they would have wanted to de delete some of the things that they deleted. But what the Baptists did is they put it back in. So, you have in our confession a strange mixture of the Westminster and the Savoy Declaration at this point. It has the structure of Savoy, but it has the content of Westminster. So that's what happened. Westminster wrote, Savoy changed it. We kept the Savoy structure and put the things back in which the Savoy people took out. And the result is the following concoction or uh, synthesis of the two previous documents. Now, in paragraph one, you have a statement that's very similar to the Westminster Confession in which you have given to us the concept and foundation of communion among the saints. In paragraph two, you have some of the practical expressions of this communion among the saints. You have the identity of these practical expressions, the method by which they are carried out, and then you have the equivalent of paragraph 3 in the Westminster. You have the limitations upon these practical expressions. You have it all there in paragraph 2. All right, let's take these paragraphs one at a time. First of all, paragraph 1 gives us the concept and foundation of communion among the saints. They're still dealing with the overall concept of the church. They've given us the overview structured according to universal and local. Now they're zeroing in on one aspect of church life. They're not operating now in terms of the distinction so much between universal and local. They're just talking now about an aspect of church life, which is the communion or fellowship which exists among Christians. Not just people inside this church, but other churches it's a broad and collective idea. It's also an individual and local idea. They're not operating, strictly speaking, with that distinction clearly up in the front of their minds anymore. Now they say this. All saints that are, that are united to Jesus Christ, their head, by his spirit and faith, Although they are not thereby made one person with him, and that comes from paragraph 3 of Westminster, have fellowship in his graces, sufferings, death, resurrection, and glory. There's the foundation. The foundation of all of our communion with one another is our personal union with Jesus Christ himself. Why are we in fellowship with each other? We are in fellowship with each other because we are united to the Lord himself. And our union with the Lord gives us communion with one another. It is a vertical union which is the basis for horizontal communion. Now, I could spend some time, I suppose, in opening up this vertical union between us and the Lord. Notice that... The two key things that they mention are the Spirit of God who dwells in us and faith which we have in Jesus Christ. This union, if it has any significance, is to be understood in terms of the operation of the Holy Spirit within us and the exercise of faith toward Jesus Christ by us. Apart from the indwelling of the Spirit and the exercise of faith, there is no personal union with Jesus Christ. And then they have this qualification that we are not made one person with him. Apparently, there's no new thing under the sun. And the idea that has been in vogue, uh, I guess, recently, that we lose our distinct personality and that we just sort of become limp, non-entities, and Jesus lives through me, so that it is, and the text they quote is Galatians 2, no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. I become a non-entity, a non-person. My personhood, which once existed, is now dismantled, and I become integrated and absorbed into the one great person of Christ. And Christ lives through me. It's not me that's living, it's Jesus that's living. Ever heard that idea before? Yeah, I guess you have. 
Anyway, they said that apparently there's no new thing under the sun. Apparently, they heard that idea back in the 1600s as well. And they say, no, they reject it. Not so. You still have to live. You still have to struggle. You still make decisions. You're still responsible to repent of your sins. You're still a unique individual person. Union with Christ does not destroy your individuality or your personhood. However, you are united with him spiritually by faith through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And as a result of this, you have fellowship in his graces. That is, you share his graces. You share his sufferings. You share his death, his resurrection, and his glory. Unity with Christ gives rise to conformity and shared life with Christ. There's the element of truth in it. We share the grace and character of Christ. We share the experience of Christ. Not only in this world do we share his death and suffering and are likened to it and conformed to it, but also in the world to come. We who have been with him in the likeness of his death will also be with him in the likeness of his resurrection and glory. And we will share his glory. We will obtain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We will be resurrected with him and seated with him. We will reign with him, rejoice with him, and experience the exaltation of his resurrected life with him and that forever. That's the fruit of being united to him. What a blessed thing. Now I say that each true Christian experiences that absolutely and infallibly, and without exception. And that is the great foundation of the communion that we have with one another. It's precisely because each true Christian experiences that. That's the foundation. Thereby, therefore, each true Christian has communion with every other true Christian. Notice, all saints are united to Jesus Christ. That's the foundation. Now the concept of the communion of the saints and being united to one another in love. They have communion in each other's gifts and graces and are obliged to the performance of such duties, public and private, in an orderly way as to conduce to their mutual good, both in the inward and outward man. Now, the concept of communion with one another is here stated in broad and generic terms. They're not speaking specifically. They're not delineating all the various things that this communion consists of. Rather, they're speaking in broad and generic terms about the concept of communion with one another. And they say that we have communion in each other's gifts and graces. We share the benefit of one another's gifts. We share the influence of one another's gifts and graces. And not only do we share, but also along with this sharing comes obligation. So there's both sharing and obligation. And the obligation that grows out of this union with one another is the performance of of Christian duty, and this is referred to in a broad way, horizontal duty, public and private, to conduce to the mutual good. In other words, we are responsible to love our fellow Christians, to love our neighbor as ourselves. And this responsibility to love has reference not only to their souls, but also to their bodies. We're supposed to love both the inward and the outward man. It's not only to touch that love which has in view the molding and developing of grace and character in them, but also the expression of that love which has in view the meeting of their physical and temporal needs in this life. If any man sees his brother in need and shuts up the bowels of his compassion, how does the love of Christ dwell in such a person? Now then, that is an overview. That is the concept and foundation the concept and foundation of the communion among Christians. Its foundation is the relation we have to Christ, and the concept is our shared 
life with one another, our union with one another, and as a result of that union, the communion and the obligation that we have to love one another and the benefit that we receive from one another. Now, secondly, the practical expressions of this, and I say that this is divided into three parts. First of all, the identity, the identity of the concrete ways in which this is expressed. Secondly, the methodology by which this is practically expressed. And thirdly, the limits with which it is to be practically expressed. Now, first of all, the identity of the activities in which this communion and union is expressed. Saints by profession are bound to maintain a holy fellowship and communion in the worship of God and in performing such other spiritual services as tend to their mutual edification as also in relieving each other in outward things according to their several abilities and necessities. So in terms of the identity of the activities, again, it's divided in terms of the inward and the outward man. You see that? First of all, spiritual. We're to worship together. Whatever other spiritual services, whether it be weeping with those that weep, whether it be a word of comfort, whether it be a word of rebuke, whether it be a word of encouragement, a word of exhortation, a word of warning, whether it be training, giving information, teaching, ruling, whatever it is that is conducive to the edification of our brethren and the good of their soul, this it is our duty to give. And then also, whether in prayer of intercession, etc. And also in relieving in outward necessities according to ability and need. It also is our duty to minister in the very practical and financial ways. Now, we secondly have the methodology by which this is to be opened up and expressed. Which communion, according to the rule of the gospel, though especially to be exercised by them in the relation wherein they stand, families, churches, yet, as God offers opportunities to be exercised to all the household of faith, even all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. They say, first of all, this kind of love and godliness is to begin at home. Take care of your own. That's the principle that the Apostle Paul articulates. If any woman that believes has widows, let her relieve them, that the church be not burdened. So you start within the context of the family. If you have your, in your own relatives, in your own household, under your own roof, a Christian brother or sister, you have a special responsibility to them. To love them and to see for the well-being of their soul. But then, those of us who are together in this particular local church have a special responsibility to one another, to love one another and to see for the good of our souls and the well-being of the outward man. But our responsibility is not limited to our family and it's not limited to this particular local assembly. It's broader than that. As much as we have opportunity, we're to do good to all the household of faith. Not only here at Trinity, but in all the other Baptist churches where there's a problem, the Reformed Baptist churches and broader than just Reformed Baptist churches, to every true evangelical church where we can minister to the good of God's people, not only in America, but also beyond that, in the entire world, for every true Christian that is in need, and we become aware of that need, and we have an ability to meet that need, whether it's spiritual or whether it's physical, whether it has to do with the inward man or the outward man, according to our ability, our responsibility is as broad as this world. It is not limited by anything except by the kingdom of Christ and the extent to which His rule has been made manifest around the earth. All the household of faith, all the household of faith, in the ultimate sense, is to be the recipient of this communion and love. Now, here comes the qualification or limitation, and it is this. Nevertheless, their communion one with another as saints does not take away or infringe the title or property which each man has in his goods and possessions. In other words, this is not the same as saying that we are Marxists. This is not the same as saying that there is no such thing as the right to private property. 
This communion that we have in one another's things and love does not mean that the right to private property is taken away and that therefore all of your goods, all of your possessions actually legally belong to the church. No, uh uh-uh. No. That the love that God's people have to one another does not violate the eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal. And that means that uh, underneath that commandment is the inviolable right of private property. The right of private property. Thou shalt not steal. And as we heard Friday night, those of you who were here, even this deep responsibility that we have for one another in helping to meet their needs, Acts chapter 4 was quoted, expounded, And that passage is actually mentioned here, indicating that even though they had all things common, they did not thereby, as a result of this communion, relinquish their title to all of their private property and enter into a socialist Marxist commune there in Jerusalem. That is not what they did. Therefore, it is not right that the consciences of Christians should be manipulated by the so-called evangelical left, which is nothing more or less than guilt manipulation by these people to make us feel guilty because of the blessings that God has given to us. We have not thereby, because of our responsibility to love our brethren, we have not thereby forfeited the title to all of our property. That is unbiblical radically unbiblical. Well, that's what we have to say today. So I promised we finished early. Well, that's as early as I've ever finished. (laughs) It may only be three minutes early, but it's early. So I... Perhaps questions is an overstatement. Perhaps it would be better to say a question. Does anyone have a, have a question? At the, Jonathan. Dr. Nichols, uh, could you clarify in chapter 26, in paragraph 9, where it speaks about the installation of elders in the church, it says that he is to be chosen thereon to by a common subject of the church itself. In Acts chapter 14, it's quoted verse 23. Uh, but in that reference, when it says that elders were appointed, it says they appointed for them elders, that mm. the they is the apostles who mm. appointed the elders. I wonder if you could clarify the distinction between the, uh, the suffrage that the church has in recognizing the officer and the fact that the church does not appear to be offered as a democracy. Okay. Did everyone hear that question? Or should I repeat it? No response. <laughs> should I repeat it? So there's some people saying yes and some saying no, so I'll repeat it. Um, basically, if I understand the question correctly, the question has to do with uh, chapter 26 and paragraph 9 in particular, the statement about the common suffrage of the church and the fact that Acts chapter 14 and verse 23 is quoted in that connection. And yet, when Acts chapter 14 and verse 23 is uh, read, it says that they appointed for them elders in every place. All right, yes, that's a good question, Jonathan. And uh, I should say that I do attempt to deal with that in the course on the doctrine of the church. However, most of the people here will not be in that course. (laughs) Therefore probably best that some time be taken to answer the question. All right, now, Acts 14.23 reads as follows. When they had appointed for them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they had believed. Now, the question of common suffrage based upon this text is probably, and this is my judgment, it's probably quoted here, because of their understanding of the meaning of this particular Greek word. It it is possible, although it's not 
so strong as to be absolutely final and dogmatic, but it's possible, probable, and even likely that what it means is to appoint by the raising of the hand. So that in the very method of appointing, there was the taking into account the raising of the hand on the part of the congregation. To appoint by the raising of the hand probably means to appoint in conjunction with the common suffrage of the people of God. I think probably if we rest our whole case upon that text, we're shaky. But that's probably the reason that they quoted it. That would be my judgment as to why they quoted that text. But since Owen gives a very uh, extensive polemic for the meaning and significance of Kairos and Echo in that context, and Owen's influence upon the independents, I think it's right to assume that that's why they used that text and used it with that understanding. No, that's a good point. That's a good point. You follow that? That this is a that this is probably this is a quotation from Owen and Company, and that is Owen's position on the text. That's a good point. That probably that is the reason that they used it. Okay. So I say our 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 usage of it would have to be broader based from other passages in Scripture. We wouldn't want the whole thing to rest upon the etymology of that one particular Greek word because the usage in Scripture is not extensive at all and uh, certainly not enough to warrant a dogmatic conclusion based on that one consideration. Well, now our time is gone. So let us pray and commend our, our season to the Lord. Our Father, we give you thanks for the time that we have had in your presence today. We thank you for the wonderful truth that each one of us is united to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith and by the Holy Spirit in our hearts, no matter what denomination we may be from or no matter what particular unique doctrines we may hold within that realm of Christian truth. We thank you, O God, that you have united us to your beloved Son and that you have united us to one another. And we pray, O oh Lord, that this truth may dominate in our minds and that accordingly, especially those of us here in this church, may be enabled more and more to love one another, to have communion with one another, and to be kept in that blessed unity of the Spirit which grows out of our union with the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us in that spirit to worship you today for your glory and honor and seal your holy word to our hearts for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.